First of all, let me just uh, uh, thank you all for being here and uh, welcome uh, 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 for this uh, second of the faculty on faculty or faculty by faculty uh, uh, lecture, uh, lecture series. Um, my name is Rick Locke. I think I've met most of you, not all of you. It's really wonderful to see you uh, here. Um, and, uh, and I'm especially happy to be able to uh, welcome and uh, look forward to hearing um, our colleague, Professor Amanda Anderson, who will be uh, talking to us about the tragic and the ordinary. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, how, how the idea of this uh, faculty by faculty seminar series um, happened and what we had, what we've planned for the rest of the semester uh, before I uh, introduce uh, uh, Amanda. So. Uh, one of the uh, truly rewarding parts of, uh, of, of the job of, of provost is um, actually having, uh, uh, and it's a short list, uh, but, um, <laughs> but one, of, one of them uh, is uh, to have uh, the opportunity to really uh, learn a lot about the amazing work that's going on uh, here on campus. I mean, one of the, it's truly striking. Uh, over, the, over the course of the summer, I visited all the different centers and uh, departments and schools, um, and over the course of the last uh, semester and a half, have had the uh, privilege to be able to meet so many uh, colleagues. And really what's incredible is, you know, you listen to the people talk about their work, how engaged and excited and how uh, innovative uh, it is. Uh, and one of the things that I heard in these conversations was a real desire, uh, a hunger, um, by people across the dis disciplines and departments to have more opportunities where people could learn about each other's work, where they could sort of exchange ideas and engage in the intellectual life that's supposed to be the core of what we do here uh, at, uh, at the university. And so this series, this faculty by faculty series, is in part a response uh, to this desire. Um, we should have more occasions, informal occasion, occasions where we can come together and learn about what, uh, what we do. Um, but it's also uh, very much aligned with uh, uh, the goals that I've set uh, for myself as, as provost and that I've communicated uh, to you all before, which is to try to promote really academic excellence and uh, build community. Those seem to me to be essential uh, to uh, what I see as the role of uh, provost. Uh, last month, uh, we launched um, this, uh, this series uh, by having a, a fascinating talk uh, by Professor of Material Sciences, uh, Nitin uh, Padtour. Uh, he's a professor in the engineering school who discussed his research uh, on a new type of solar cell uh, which offers hope for generating solar power in a much more uh, efficient and less expensive uh, way. And what was so great about it, uh, again, it was a room filled with people, uh, maybe leaning more heavily on the science side than on the humanity side, um, but sort of speaking in a very kind of um, open public uh, way so that people like me who know nothing about engineering and uh, physical sciences uh, could, um, could follow along uh, and learn. Uh, next month, uh, we'll have the chair of pediatrics, uh, Dr. Phyllis Dennery, uh, and she's going to speak to us about the work she's been doing on children, families, and communities in the healthcare system. And she, maybe some of you heard her speak um, at the campaign launch uh, about really interesting work that she does on race and class and on uh, sort of uh, early childhood health outcomes. Uh, it's really uh, fascinating. And then in May, we have our uh, professor of history, Robert Self, who will deliver a uh, talk over lunch uh, called uh, The Unhappiest Place on Earth, The Family Economy in the American uh, Century. Um, what we're trying to do is have different talks from people from different disciplines, different departments, um, and to also do it at different times of the day. So I know that people have very complicated <laughs> schedules, and so if we have it in the evening and not everyone can do that, we can have others uh, at lunchtime or in the afternoon, and hopefully through this variety, everyone or as many people as possible uh, can, uh, can um, come. Tonight, uh, it's a true uh, a pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Professor Amanda Anderson. Uh, Amanda joined Brown uh, in 2012 as the Andrew Mellon Professor of Humanities and English, and she became the director of the Cogat Center uh, in uh, 2000, July 2015. Now, as the program, the little card that you have uh, notes, she is a literary scholar and theorist who has written on 19th century literature and culture, as well as on contemporary debates uh, in the humanities. She has published a number of books, scholarly articles, and essays, including her forthcoming book, Bleak Liberalism. 
Uh, she has received numerous honors and awards for her work, including being invited to deliver the distinguished Clarendon Lectures uh, in English at Oxford University last December. Uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have Amanda here uh, at Brown. She is an exceptional scholar who is intimately interdisciplinary in her work uh, and is building a vibrant intellectual community uh, at Cogat. Those of you who haven't been to Cogat uh, recently, I would encourage you to go visit it because you can really feel the kind of energy. It's very uh, palpable. Um, and she is, uh, not surprisingly, a staunch advocate uh, for the value of humanities. Uh, if you have not seen it, and I had not seen it until recently, I would encourage you to watch her Brown TEDx talk, where in 10 minutes she discusses the pressures that have faced the humanities in recent years with policymakers and others calling into question the value of the humanities as a course of study. She also uh, offers tools for addressing that nagging dinnertime question that perhaps the less enlightened members of all of our families has asked, uh, probably a number of you, which is like, well, what will you do with a degree in, it could be English or some other humanities? Uh, and, uh, and I think her uh, response is both uh, direct uh, and persuasive, because what she argues is the humanities opens one up to an appreciation and an understanding of the centrality of the questions of value to the human experience. And they help one begin to grapple with those questions. And truly, what can be more important than that? Uh, and so please join me in thanking Amanda. And thank you so much, Amanda, for agreeing to speak to us this evening. Thank you, Rick, for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. I think this is a wonderful um, idea, this series. And um, I did try to pitch this in a way that it will reach beyond um, my peeps, many of whom are here. So, OK. So my talk tonight is drawn from a larger project entitled Psyche and Ethos which explores the relation between psychological explanation and moral understanding in the modern era and the particular place of literary studies in this story. The premise that I begin with is this. Since the advent of Freudian psychoanalysis and extending up through the more recent claims of cognitive science and social psychology, psychological explanation has challenged, displaced, and to some degree eroded traditional frameworks of moral understanding. One could, of course, adduce a longer genealogy, extending back to utilitarianism and to Hume, and even dramatically earlier to Plato and Aristotle. The challenges posed by various psychological frameworks are various. And there are, of course, ways in which moral commitments animate psychology in its various guises. But there are nonetheless key ways in which psychology has posed a challenge to morality. And this has become a central question in some of the current literature emanating from neuroscience. Interestingly, literary studies has to date produced interesting work on the topic of reading as cognition and as mind reading. But it has not engaged the challenge to moral frameworks in the way that it might and in some sense should given the extent to which traditional moral assumptions animate literary concepts and modes, including tragedy and character, and given the central role that interacting psychological and moral frameworks play in the tradition of the realist novel. I'm going to leave aside the manner in which literary studies has engaged evolutionary psychology, which does address moral questions, but in a way I find highly problematic, for reasons which I would be happy to share in the Q&A, and whose short answer is evolutionary psychology. <laughs> the talk is roughly divided into two parts, a discussion of the challenge to morality by certain forms of cognitive science and social psychology, and then a literary reading of a tale by Henry James, by means of which I hope to draw out some of my central claims, both critical and reconstructive. I had originally planned to talk about George Eliot as my literary example, for those of you who read the abstract. <laughs> but when I got down to figuring out how to make this a digestible post-dinner morsel, 
I really don't want to tax you. So I, it was a little too complicated. So this was a nice kind of uh, focused example, I thought. Okay. One more brief prefatory remark. The topic I will be discussing is not only interdisciplinary, but also caught up in what I take to be a crucial condition of the contemporary university, as well as the broader field of intellectual debate beyond the university. And that is the condition of what we might call field or disciplinary authority. This is an important condition to notice and diagnose in a context where collaboration is seen to be a central value and aim precisely because the rhetoric of collaboration can soften or occlude important questions of assumed disciplinary authority on the one hand and disciplinary limits and limitations on the other. Recent work in cognitive psychology and in moral psychology has shed considerable light on the degree to which various psychological impulses, reflexes, and mechanisms interrupt or derail what we think of as moral autonomy and moral deliberation, or the capacity to make considered and reliable judgments about the right thing to do in any case. For the purposes of tonight's discussion, I want to focus on three key claims that help to illustrate this challenge to morality. First, a series of experiments have served as the basis for a dual process theory of thinking one that asserts that much of our thinking takes place automatically, conditioned by forms of bias, or by situational factors that prime our responses, factors that range from the hearing of certain words, the presence of ambient noise, and various occurrences that precede the moment of moral choice. For example, in one experiment, participants who found a coin were more likely to help someone than those who had not. There are some more disturbing findings having to do with authority, obedience, and human aggression, as the famous Milgram experiment demonstrated. That widely known experiment, conducted in the early 1960s, showed that subjects were willing to punish a screaming victim with repeated electric shocks when requested by an experimenter. Some of the work in cognitive science has drawn significant attention and achieved bestseller status participating in a widespread interest in the notion that we are wired to think and act in certain ways and that long-held understandings of human cognition and human judgment, central to both the humanities and the social sciences, most notably economics, need to be adjusted. For example, in Daniel Kahneman's popular 2011 study of the dual process paradigm, Thinking Fast and Slow, it is argued that our thinking and action are highly susceptible to what Kahneman calls the fast and powerful system one, which he opposes to the traditional conception of thinking as controlled and fundamentally deliberative, system two, the slow system. Kahneman demonstrates the many ways that intuitive or fast modes of thinking favor forms of bias that lead to bad decisions. These include one, hindsight bias, two, the inability to acknowledge sunk costs, as in not selling a low-performing stock or not leaving a long but less than satisfactory relationship. Three, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> zoigma. Three, the tendency to misremember based on how things felt at their worst and how things ended. And four, in a striking neologism, to miswant, given our optimism bias and our tendency to discount risk. The second claim I wish to single out is that, and these are asserted claims, not my claims. The second claim I wish to single out is that moral judgments themselves are typically made automatically and intuitively, and that moral reasoning is itself therefore necessarily post hoc. This view is argued by Jonathan Haidt in a widely cited 2001 article titled The Emotional Dog and Its Rational Tail. As Haidt argues through a wide survey of the experimental literature, most moral reasoning takes place after the fact of intuitive judgment and, quote, the reasoning process is more like a lawyer defending a client than a judge or scientist seeking the truth. This claim is in turn related to the third claim I wish to highlight, which is the more psychologically consequential one, that self-justification is a driving force in moral discourse and in psychological self-understanding. These findings and claims challenge not only traditional understandings of moral reasoning and deliberation, but also the conception of character that underwrites the Aristotelian tradition of virtue ethics, which is to say that they challenge to some degree the two major strands of moral philosophy, 
the Kantian tradition, and the Aristotelian one. In a series of works, most some of them written in collaboration, the bioethicist Maria Merritt has addressed the challenge that new psychological findings pose to virtue ethics, and particularly to the concept of character. The work is premised on the idea that philosophers would do well to confront and not dismiss the empirical findings of the new psychological sciences. What Merritt is most concerned with is the evidence suggesting that human action is affected by cognitive processes in the automatic system that seem to act independently of the individual's reflectively endorsed personal norms. This results in what Merritt calls moral dissociation, where action and avowed norms conflict. One interesting further claim is that forms of anguish or feeling badly about what one is nonetheless doing in no way mitigate the stark disparity, and in that sense cannot be used to rescue standard conceptions of character or virtue ethics, as some scholars have tried to do. As Merritt puts it, there is no way to prettify this result by talking about obedient subjects' inner states. Indeed, one could say that allowing oneself to be solaced by one's inner state in the face of dissonance itself is, is itself a psychological mechanism that allows us to evade full responsibility for our actions. Merritt notes that Stanley Milgram makes this very point in Obedience and Authority, quoting Milgram, subjective feelings are largely irrelevant to the moral issue at hand, so long as they are not transformed into action. The attitude of guards at a concentration camp are of no consequence when in fact they are allowing the slaughter of innocent men to take place before them. Similarly, so-called, still Milgram, so-called intellectual resistance in occupied Europe, in which persons by a twist of thought felt that they had defied the invader, was merely indulgence in a consoling psychological mechanism. The aim of Merritt's project is to respond to the challenges of new findings in cognitive science, both by adjusting the light in which we view these findings and by advancing strategies that will counter the morally adverse tendencies that the findings reveal. On the first count, Merritt seeds the importance of context or environment in the shaping of moral action and moral response, but provides an expanded conception of it which sounds something like an engineered communitarianism. In order to promote consistency of moral behavior, she argues, we need to, quote, inhabit climates of social expectation that elicit and support the consistency in question. What Merritt is arguing for is a kind of retraining or a willed affiliation with social context that will be formative of desirable moral habits ingrained over time. In some sense, she is advocating that we simply become more aware of the types of thinking that govern the automatic processes and be on the alert for situations where they might get activated. But there's also a reframing of the power of situations so that they become not so much arbitrary triggers of up-down decisions, but rather influential mediums of moral awareness and naturalized virtues. A similar move is evident in Haight's essay, The Emotional Dog and Its Rational Tale, whose subtitle, a social intuitionist approach to moral judgment reveals a similar turn the article will take. I shall return to one feature of these responses that I find central, and that is the appeal to habits formed over time or practices experienced over time and through immersion in a socio-cultural surround. But for the moment, I want to note that both scholars producing and engaging the new literature in cognitive science and social psychology tend to emphasize the need to address moral concerns that arise in light of their findings. Of course it makes sense that a scholar in moral psychology or moral philosophy would do this, but a question still arises about where and how moral authority over the moral implications of cognitive science is assumed. A very interesting article appeared in the February 25th issue of the New York Review of Books entitled, The Psychologists Take Power which addresses this very issue. Much of the article follows out the troubling collaboration of social psychologists with the US torture program in the wake of 
But there's also a central emphasis as well on the questionable legitimacy from a philosophical standpoint of the claim of certain psychologists to moral authority based on selected scientific experiments, whether MRI studies or experiments tracking moral decisions under simulated or staged conditions. As the author, Tamsin Shaw, puts it, it's a fallacy to suggest that expertise in psychology, a descriptive natural science, can itself qualify someone to determine what is morally right and wrong. A painstaking analytic elaboration of this position can be found in the philosopher Selim Berker's article, The Normative Insignificance of Neuroscience, published in the journal Philosophy and Public Affairs. Berker essentially argues that within a particular subfield of neuroscientifically inspired utilitarianism, represented by the work of Joshua Green and Peter Singer, every normative assumption or claim allegedly yielded by the science is actually presupposed from the armchair, as the philosophers like to say. More fascinating are the instances in which works of psychology that challenge our sense of moral autonomy themselves circle back to moral aspirations that are to some degree mooted by their own findings. In doing so, these ostensibly deflationary works of psychology often pay homage to the very ideals they seem to debunk. Despite their scientific claims or leanings, that is, these works seem to be motivated by moral concern or to imagine they are necessarily appealing to readers who are so motivated. The debunking itself participates in a kind of moral drama, something like the taming of hubris or the pathos of naturalism. A somewhat chastened project or practice is then sketched in light of the findings. This is worthy of note as a feature of the genre. What do we make of it? I suggest it is a symptom of an unresolved question about the nature and reach of moral life. Let me move now to assess what I take to be a, a misleading feature of the way that the moral implications of the dual process claim are discussed, which will then set the stage for my own claim that the psychological frameworks at play do not adequately capture core elements of human experience that animate the textures and forms of our moral lives and our commitments to moral reflection. A significant contributor to this problem is what I will identify as a blunt conception of experience within time, reflected in part in the punctual nature of the experiments. My literary example, to which I will turn momentarily, will serve further to illuminate this large problem. Once one has established the existence of intuitive, automatic, or fast processes and argued for their importance, it is of course uncontroversial in some simply descriptive way to call moral reasoning or deliberation something that necessarily takes place after the fact or in a different temporal register that is separate from the moment of decisive judgment or action. But does that mean that it, somehow, it is somehow fundamentally illusory or motivated or expressive of an inescapable bad faith? It's worth noting that such a suggestion, part of the frisson of these findings, is itself informed by a frustrated ideal of rational self-transparency and moral autonomy. Both the tail that wags the dog premise and the very use of the term slow or post hoc seem to demote and delegitimize moral reasoning. But simply because one can identify automatic processes, does, does that mean that deliberative processes are somehow operating blind, oblivious that they are powerless against cognitive mechanisms that eclipse their efforts. The very fact that so much effort is expended in rumination and moral reflection, whether retrospective or prospective, argues for its existential significance. And it's typically linked, that is rumination and reflective reasoning, typically linked to core values that lend meaningfulness to individual lives and that are expressed in various cultural values as well. The arguments about slow or post hoc reasoning strangely disregard the fact that ongoing moral rumination and reasoning is a practice that helps to define one's selfhood, one's relation to others, and one's commitments to larger communities and ideals. Indeed, one of the striking anthropological facts about human societies is how much time we actually devote to discussion of norms and those who are seen to violate norms. What is involved is far more than some trivializing observation that people like to gossip. 
Important new work by the anthropologist Webb Keane aims to acknowledge the way transhistorical and transcultural practices of everyday reflexivity and communicative principles of respect and repair animate diverse local conventions or belief systems. He moreover emphasizes the way in which argument, reasoning, and justification pervade social interactions well beyond the formal practices of logical argument. The problem with much of the current psychological literature that tends to be so gleefully embraced in the media is that it typically falls short precisely when it comes to the more existential or meaning-laden realms of life. Thus, it's not just that there are flaws in methodologies or fallacious modes of proceeding or unearned claims to authority, but rather a limited or partial understanding of ordinary life as it is lived in time. Here it seems to be no accident that anthropology and literary studies are particularly illuminating by way of contrast. One of the late introduced distinctions in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is that between the experiencing self and the remembering self. One of the findings of his research is that we tend to misremember based on how things felt at their worst and how they ended. A key experiment that supports this finding has to do with an experience of cold water immersion of one's hand. Each subject in the experiment was exposed to two cold water immersions. One was a 60-second experience of steady cold the other a 90-second immersion in which the temperature is increased just slightly during the last 30 seconds, but is still uncomfortably cold. Kahneman finds decisive and manifestly irrational the fact that when asked which experience they would like to repeat with no knowledge of how long each had lasted, participants typically chose the longer immersion even though the last 30 seconds are still uncomfortable, if slightly less so than the, than the 60 seconds that precede. But is that irrational, really? Experience of time is a complex thing, and the forms of meaning that structure our lives, the narratives and memories that give them integrity and value, are not reducible to quantifiable pain and pleasure units. The experiment of cold water immersion seems to discount the value of the experience of relative relief, apart from seconds clocked. There's, of course, some psychological truth to the claim about forms of remembering, especially when one considers experiences of longer duration and more heightened personal significance, such as a relationship or a job. But in that case, to call it misremembering seems less psychologically insightful than blunt. Often what gets highlighted as one thinks back on past experiences depends on very complex forms of processing loss or disappointment or achievement. How one thinks back can vary moment to moment, even as it shows trend lines over time. And sometimes how something ends is the most important thing about it. Sometimes it's not. Which is simply to say that Kahneman's claims really show their weakness when they approach the complexities of human experience, and particularly the complexity of human experience in time. If we turn to another major concept of his, the irrational commitment to sunk costs, it's crucial to acknowledge that there is a profound gulf between a financial misjudgment, such as holding on to a poorly performing stock, and a moral choice made amidst uncertain conditions and in relation to core values. Remaining committed to a project or a relationship that gives one's life meaning, even if it may later fail, is simply not captured by the notion of sunk costs, which by imposing a financial and calculative framework on human experience, evacuates it of its meaningfulness and purpose. A somewhat different issue arises with the theories of psychological self-justification. While the theory seems to suggest that individuals may be so driven to protect themselves from an indicting responsibility that their actions will not, in fact, catch up with them, it remains the case that the phenomenon is premised upon some deep sense that one knows at some level that one has acted wrongly. Of course, one could simply be aware that according to social norms, one will be judged as being in the wrong and wish to avoid the consequences of such judgment while still not necessarily according the norm any intrinsic merit. In this case, it would simply be a case of impression management. But such a situation does not really capture complex structures of unease and self-deception that characterize the phenomenon of self-justification where individuals simply do not want to acknowledge their own responsibility for actions that will adversely affect their own self-conception. 
This informing moral dimension makes this whole literature a bit more amenable in the end to what we might call the reformist turn, or the call for needful effort for vigilance and honest admission. Having said that, it's worth remarking that this literature does not itself sufficiently acknowledge key differences among the forms in which self-justifying discourse presents. That is, the differences among what we might call uneasy self-justification, unconscious self-justification, and manipulative self-justification. This raises a huge question which I will not be addressing tonight, but the key point here is to remark the persistence of moral concern in the literature and its conceptual apparatus, and to explore what the implications of that concern are. The psychology of cognitive dissonance and self-justification typically relies upon informing moral values of integrity, or at least motivating, if half-lit, awareness of wrong. I now turn to my literary example, a 1903 story by Henry James, The Beast in the Jungle, which is interestingly about the passage of time in the midst of a dramatic expectation about one's life. As I move through my discussion, you will see that I am concerned not only to show how forms of moral life or moral time lost, are lost to view in the psychological literature, but also to highlight a certain evasion of moral frameworks in the literary field itself. This dual focus is pursued throughout the larger project of which this is a part, and it's, I, I can't go into it very much this evening, but I'm also tracing something that's happening in literary studies, which is a kind of um, uh, subordination of moral frameworks to other frameworks of analysis. The Beast in the Jungle, as some of you will know, centers on a no longer quite so young man, John Marcher, who re-encounters after a period of 10 years a woman he had met by chance. He meets her while visiting friends who live near to the country estate in which she lives in the condition of a poor relation. As he is drawn into conversation with her, he comes to remember that he met her previously, and she, who remembers their prior meeting distinctly better than he does, informs him that at the time of their meeting, he had told her a secret about himself. This woman, May Bertram, characterizes his secret in the following way. You said you had had from your earliest time as the deepest thing within you, the sense of being kept for something rare and strange, possibly prodigious and terrible, that was sooner or later to happen to you, that you had in your bones the foreboding and conviction of, and that would perhaps overwhelm you. You need slides with Henry James. <laughs> <laughs> Over the course of the story, which covers a span of years, they form a relationship that consists of their waiting together to watch for the event that he anticipates. Nothing ever happens, apart from typically Jamesian conversations about the condition of their strange companionate waiting on the sense of his expectation. <laughs> Eventually, May ends up contracting a blood disorder, then dies, and finally, sometime after her death, Marcher has a powerful realization while visiting her gravesite and glimpsing the face of a grief-stricken man, also at the cemetery, that what he had missed was her. The truth of his existence turns out to be the fact that all the while he had waited, the wait was itself his portion. What would have allowed him to live instead of merely waiting to live would have been to love her. Instead, quote, she had loved him for himself, whereas he had never thought of her. Ah, how it hugely glared at him, but in the chill of his egotism and the light of her use. I will now read to you the very end of the story. The horror of waking. This was knowledge. Knowledge under the breath of which the very tears in his eyes seemed to freeze. Through them, nonetheless, he tried to fix it and hold it. He kept it there before him so that he might feel the pain. That, it, that it la at least, belated and bitter, that at least, belated and bitter, had something of the taste of life. But the bitterness suddenly sickened him, and it was as if horribly he saw in the truth, in the cruelty of his image, what had been appointed and done. He saw the jungle of his life and saw the lurking beast. Then, while he looked, perceived it as by a stir of the air, rise, huge and hideous, for the leap that was to settle him. His eyes darkened, it was close, 
and instinctively turning in his hallucination to avoid it, he flung himself face down on the tomb. It seems fair to say that this is a lurid and melodramatic <laughs> ending that feels out of keeping with the tenor of the tale. It is strongly criticized by certain critics. Eve Sedgwick's reading, by which many have come to know the story at all, memorably argues that, quote, to the extent that Marcher's secret has a content, that content is homosexual. In the end, for Sedgwick, Marcher represents, quote, the irredeemably self-ignorant man who embodies and enforces heterosexual compulsion. What might, end quote, what might have been a psychologically healthy embrace of non-normative sexuality and a bracing departure from social conformity becomes instead a stark egoism yoked to normative heterosexuality. While all the elements of a better story are in place, according to Sedgwick, they are derailed by a failure of control and presumably nerve on James's part. Of the utmost interest for Sedgwick is the unmistakable coding of the homoeroticism within the tale, the brilliance of the depiction of May's knowingness in relation to the sexual secret, and the complex way in which temporality and cognitive awareness play out in relation to one another in the story. With the slow advance of time, according to Sedgwick, May becomes aware of a different secret, the sexual one. For all of these reasons, one should resist what Sedgwick sees as critics, quote, eager to help James moralize the ending. They should resist this and focus, uh, they should resist this, sorry, screwed up that sentence, okay. Um, Sedgwick's reading is masterful in its combination of inventive close reading, which I can't reproduce here, and the assumption of something like esotericism on James's part, as it tracks both suggestive wording drawn from a broadly conceived anachronistic gay lexicon and fears of the monstrosity of what, what awaits him, cast by Sedgwick as culturally conditioned and expressive of a homophobic surround. It is a rightly famous reading. But I will suggest a different way of looking at the ending as well as at the complex treatment of time, and especially as it relates to what Sedgwick views as a moralized ending. Before doing so, I want to briefly remark another critic's reading, that of Leo Bersani, which shares important features with Sedgwick's, most centrally an aversion to what is seen as John Marcher's fall from a stringent and admirably aesthetic mode of virtuality, a version of life as art, as it were, to a discourse of missed passion, moral failure, and conventional self-actualization. Bersani's reading of the story begins with a dismissal in the tone of weary sophistication of the revelation of a love never properly recognized, a love that might have given meaning to Marcher's life. From this perspective, Bersani writes, quote, Marcher becomes one of James's least interesting and least appealing characters. For Bersani, both the psychological and the moral dimension of what we might call the traditional reading of the story are unsatisfying. A counter reading of Marcher as an emblem of art serves to subtract the effects of an ending that is at once aesthetically vulgar and socially conformist. It is in this context that I wish to offer a different approach to this tale, one that I hope will illuminate its existential density and its moral force, which is entirely dependent on an understanding of the workings of time. In this case, I want to underscore that the challenge to morality in the literary critical readings is coming from multiple fronts, from the psychoanalytic disdain for morality as a blunt and ultimately defensive or infantile way of giving value to existence, from a form of aestheticism that sees morality as both conventional and as limiting, and from a commitment to anti-normativity as such. These are field-specific forms of the challenge to morality as it manifests in literary studies. But I will also aim to underscore through my reading how a certain perspective on this story can also help to counter the particular problems that I identified within contemporary cognitive science and social psychology, which constitutes a challenge to morality from another front. The complexities of time are central to the story, as is evident from the opening scene, which involves a certain defamiliarization based not only on the span of years in which the two characters have not seen one another, but also on the ways in which time as suffering is legible in May Bertram's situation in the house in which she lives, as I mentioned earlier, as a poor relation. Time has an ongoing effect in the story on the recognizability of self and other, and on the mutability of relations as they stretch out in time. 
Various things happen imperceptibly in time. The growing sense that May knows something about his secret that Marcher doesn't. The deterioration of May and her increasing remove and aging itself. We are told that Marcher suddenly notices one day that she looks much older to him than he had ever thought of her being, and that it is this that, quote, brought the truth home to him that he too is older. But other less teleological forms of passing time are noted. Most strikingly, the, the effect of their time together on May's home. The passage I have in mind occurs in the first conversation during which May intimates that she has a higher awareness of what Marcher's fate might be, that she is certain her, quote, curiosity, as he calls it, will be but too well repaid. The passage reads, they were frankly grave now. He had got up from his seat, had turned once more about the little drawing room to which, year after year, he brought his inevitable topic, in which he had, as he might have said, tasted their intimate community with every sauce, where every object was as familiar to him as the things of his own house, and the very carpets were worn with his fitful walk, very much as the desks in old counting houses are worn by the elbows of generations of clerks. The generations of his nervous moods had been at work there, and the place was the written history of his whole middle life. This evokes a deep sense of shared time, and in fact brings home the sense in which they are a couple. Stanley Cavell has an interesting reading of the story in which he asserts that they are in fact as if married, then revises that to say that she's married to him, but he's not married to her until the final scene at the grave. And in fact, this noted asymmetry gets at the way in which Marcher's narcissism and sense of entitlement is so important to the story, even despite his repeated moments of awareness of his selfishness and attempts to correct for it, largely by mentioning it to May Bartram. <laughs> but May becomes a significantly empowered figure in the story, despite her seeming subordination to the drama of his non-life. She comes to see that John Marcher is missing his own life and somehow lacks the capacity to see that. Her insight is psychological and moral. In a way, one could say that he's married in a sort of unconscious way while she is not. She is slowly orbiting away from him because she sees that he is not equal to her commitment to him. And I don't mean commitment in any conventional sense here. She believes in the meaningfulness of the time they are living together. <coughs> And she sees that his own sense of entitlement to a life unlived is causing him to miss his own life, which is also their life together and apart. While certain elements of the text invite one to read Marcher's realization as conventionally romantic, including the melodramatic scene at the graveyard, I think the move to disregard this moment in relation to other aspects of the text, as evident in both Sedgwick's and Bersani's readings, causes one to look too far afield for the meaning of the story which is a moral and existential one. It is too conveniently the case that the ending is pathetic and so allows for the rescuing aesthetic or queer reading. There are two initial points I would flag about the ending, in fact, which go unremarked in these readings. First, and really quite startlingly, we are told that the illumination at the gravesite might have come about another way. Marcher has been in the habit, after a year traveling in the East, of visiting May's grave regularly, where in the open page of his friend's tomb, he can read the facts of the past and the truth of his life. This ritual continues unchanged until the event that produces the finale. He describes it as an accident, superficially slight, which moved him quite in another direction with a force beyond any of his impressions of Egypt or India. It was a thing of merest chance, the turn as he afterwards felt of a hair. That, that's the moment in the, gray, in the cemetery where he sees the grief-stricken man. Though he was in, and, but here's what's important. Though he was indeed to live to believe that if light hadn't come to him in this particular fashion, it would still have come in another. He was to live to believe this, I say, though he was not to live, I may not less definitely mention, to do much else. <laughs> Gotta love Henry James. <laughs> One wonders if this means that Marcher may have had the realization, but without the same degree of theatrics, in a different setting, perhaps, and with a muted éclat. But what does seem insisted upon is that the event was waiting for him, taking its time to unfold as certain realizations do. This is slow psychic time, without active deliberation, 
but still guided by something deeply felt, planted through experience, and advanced at least partly through rumination. The theorists of automatic processes don't seem to account for the fact that not all automatic processes are fast. Some are very slow and proceed through an elusive dynamic between conscious thought and unaware gestation. Grief and mourning work this way, and they in essence precede the moment of awakening for Marcher. Even if Marcher is mourning mostly for his own lost past, and therefore still arguably in a narcissistic mode, there's something in the loss of May Bertram's goading and companionate presence that lays the ground for his suddenly remembering her in her specificity. The lesson he learns, recall, is precisely this. He had seen outside of his life, not learned it within, the way a woman was mourned when she was loved for herself. That's, again, he's getting that from seeing the face of the other uh, mourner. Such was the force of his conviction of the meaning of the stranger's face. Marcher is thus moving in this last phase of his tale to something more than mourning for someone whose value was fully known in the moment. He's experiencing a kind of tragic regret, a post hoc realization about his life, a day of reckoning. The point I want to emphasize here is that James gives us a powerful rendition of a kind of existential inauthenticity one in which forms of entitlement block one from apprehending the value of the life one is already living. It is a psychologically compelling portrait, and it has a moral, a moral that's not linked to conventional life as much as to ordinary embedded life. One of the limitations of much cultural and literary and cultural criticism of the present time is the inability to make any distinction between the two, which is to say between the conventional and the ordinary. The problem in the literature on cognitive science is different. It abstracts from ordinary life to construct experiments that miss the interplay of slow and fast time over time. I focused on this particular example in order to draw out a claim about what we might call moral time, the ways in which moral action and moral life involve more than punctual acts or limited processes of deliberation, but take place over time through processes at once ruminative and reasoning. Interestingly, criticism, too, involves a kind of slow time, a dwelling with and elaborating readings that seek to draw out the felt commitments of a particular work of literature or thought. I chose a work this evening which treats a single companionate relation, partly for reasons of focus and because of James's attention to the pulses of everyday life. But the larger project aims to extend the field of inquiry to consider those psychologists of the ordinary, what is known as the middle group in British psychoanalysis, in relation to realist and modernist writers, in order to show the ethical and social stakes of a life which understands ordinary life as both ground and achievement, as always fraught with tensions and frustrations, but as ultimately the basis for our understanding and promotion of broader social and political practices. Thank you. <laughs> so I would be happy to take questions, comments. Of course, Mr. Paul Geyer, always first out of the gate. Yep. Well, you did mention comments. So <laughs> I know. I almost took that out. Something. But I knew that wouldn't stop No, me. no. I'm glad you left <laughs> it in. Uh, uh, I was really struck uh, in, that, uh, in your discussion of uh, work by merit about how first it was a reference to Kantianism and Aristotelianism as the two sort of main traditions of uh, moral philosophy. But then uh, she seemed only actually to, to it launch her attack upon Aristotelianism. Yeah, no, that's all she's uh, concerned with. That was yeah. not Yeah, and her. the thing that's, yeah. that's, struck, that's, uh, that's striking is, of course, that in the Kantian tradition, although, of course, this goes way back, there's always been a recognition that you know, we know what, we may know what's right and wrong or have firm beliefs about what's right and wrong on the one hand, and yet, of course, there were all kinds of uh, factors that we do sure. otherwise. Sure. Right. Uh, and, like, that's no secret. Uh, I mean, we've known that since antiquity. Uh, and the psychological experiments about how easily people are prompted to do things that, uh, you know, we, from some other point of view, or they themselves regard as uh, immoral, uh, would actually only be of any interest if they could establish not that 
people sometimes, or even often, do what they themselves even believe to be immoral. But if they could establish only that people can always be prompted to do what's immoral in spite of their knowledge of it, or that they can never do what's moral if these other pressures are working on them. And it doesn't seem to me, at least, that any of these experiments would come close to establishing that. Uh, and I sort of, well, was put a question mark after that. I mean, I'm curious how you think about that. Uh. Oh, okay. The question mark is there. Okay. Um, um, I thought that was an interim question mark. Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, yes. I mean, I, I, uh, I see the point that um, many uh, thinkers in the history of moral thought um, introduce persuasive elements of psychological realism that add complexity and texture to their accounts. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, you know there's some kind of stark bifurcation. I'm trying to kind of like trace moments where I think there's been not only rhetorically a strong and, and you know and, and I'm, I'm also interested in the kind of effects this has in the cultural discursive field. Very strong challenges to um, what we think of as traditional moral framework. So that's one thing I'm trying to do. And then also, of course, I gave you know, a segment, but I address a series of instances in which I think there is a, a successful and interesting um, interarticulation of the moral and the psychological. And one time, say that are certain moral realist novelists of the 19th century. Um, I don't know about your last point. I mean, I don't think that. Uh, it would only be of interest if they had proved that we were robots. I mean, I just, I don't, I, I mean, I, I realize I'm, I'm you know, um, maybe saying that a little too strongly, but I, I think that it, you have to kind of look at, there, there are several different things you can do. You can say um, there's limited, uh, there's a kind of limited uh, yield here in these experiments because they're only showing that this sometimes happens or they're showing that it happens under uh, conditions which are themselves um, highly selective, right. or you know their methodology is screwed up, etc. Right. Um, but I think what I'm more interested in are are the uh, actually the way in which it's being taken up and um, played, I guess I would say, in the intellectual and cultural field. Uh, but I also don't, I also just want to go back to that, that last point. I just don't think, you know, that the burden is that high for making this uh, an important kind of um, salvo in, in, in the larger field of uh, psychology and morality, that they haven't proved that we always do this. So anyway, that's my answer. Uh, Bonnie? Hi, I'm Bonnie Honig in Political Science at MCM. So, Amanda, that was a really great talk. Thank you. And um, here's my question. <clears throat> I think um, that I love the way that you mobilize the idea of slow psychic time against the automatic processes argument that we get from areas that are new in psychology. But I'm wondering whether there isn't, I'm wondering why there isn't also a coalition with queer theory on that very point. Because arguably you find in queer theory an opposition to that sort of uh, literature as well. So my question is, is there a way to criticize queer theory readings of this story in the way that you do while granting to that part of the literature a certain normativity, which at the moment you deny on the basis of Bersani's aestheticism. But I would at least argue that Sedgwick has a high, sort of, uh, a highly normative argument to make as well. Um, so what if we thought about the queer theory uh, alternative as having a temporality of its own, maybe a time of infinite deferral or something like that, slower than slow or different than slow, in other words, a third kind of temporality. Um, and I think this could be especially true for Sedgwick, who writes on behalf of authenticity, arguably. So I just want to know what the commit, you know, I would, in Amanda speak, I would say, what's the normative commitment that's pressuring your um, critique or dismissal of queer theory? Because it doesn't seem to be as explicitly stated as the normative content against the psychology part of your paper. Yeah. 
that was great. Um, you know, uh, I, I, let me say a few things. There's a distortion effect from this particular uh, paper because I'm so, as what, uh, literary critics get very invested in their reading contra the other, you know, reading. So there's a, like, Sedgwick is representing a reading that I think is, is wrong on this, on this. And she's also serving symptomatically. Um, yeah, so now I have a longer kind of, a, I, Sedgwick's complicated and she had several turns in her career, okay? Um, and I would say that, yes, I, I do think that she had herself strong value commitments. Um, and I do think that she herself turned from a, a stronger anti-normative line, as you well know, since we co-taught that famous essay together. Um, it's called uh, the, whatever, the paranoid and the reparative, yeah. It's anti-paranoia, i.e. anti-hermeneutics of suspicion. But anyway, she herself turned from a, from a kind, a form of queer theory that was more anti-normative than one was much more devoted to the textures of experience in time and, and for, you know, personal and uh, intellectual reasons. Um, and I also would like to say that right now, the, you know, at the moment, uh, queer theory is engaging very interestingly, not only temporality and has been for about a decade, but also uh, the ordinary. Um, so yes, I mean, there's a, you know, I don't, I don't, this isn't meant to sound as like a dismissal of, of queer theory, though I could see uh, how it might. I'm not meaning for her to stand for all of that. I just think it's, what bothers me about her reading of the story is that she can't see ordinary, like, like what I take to be a kind of engagement with something ordinary and embedded because it gets so easy, easily collapsed with the conventional and with an oppressive norm. So, yeah, but thank you. That's super helpful. Yeah. Uh, I think the guy I do here and then you. <laughs> My name is Anthony Haywood. I do thank you for a perfectly wonderful talk and even more so for being willing to field questions afterwards. Unfortunately, scientists always make their questions very brief. Uh, so my question is, while tempted, of course, to rise to the defense of Popper and the creation of art, armchair theories, I wondered if you felt that your presentation had focused very much on the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala and the gratification of the individual, and whether you felt there might be evolutionary contrib contributions to the survival and evolution of morality theory, and whether those also should be taken into account. Um, wow, that's a great question. Um, and it was, it was crisply posed. Uh, okay, <laughs> now I will be uncrisp. Um, <laughs> I don't want to just, you know, bash evolutionary psychology, evolutionary theory. My, and, but I am going to say my, my central problem with it. And you know, maybe I, you know, there may be there may be aspects of it that uh, um, I may I may not have as comprehensive a knowledge of it um, as you know uh, lies behind your question. Let me just start from the way it's been used in literary studies and just, you know, what I, what tends to be the case is that um, the evolutionary accounts of achieved morality just seem to me almost consistently to devolve upon an investment in cooperation that is fundamentally self-interested. And I find that narrowing and frustrating. And I don't think it's because, you know, I, I, I just, I, 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 it, it, that's, where I, that's where they lose me. Um, so the, the work in literary studies that's been done, there's been a couple of really interesting books, one called Comeuppance, which argues that we, uh, by Billy Flash, William Flash, that argues that we take delight in reading stories basically because um, the pleasure, it's schadenfreude theory, mm -hmm. the, the uh, poetic justice occurs and we're glad because bad people get punished 
and there are various people called altruistic punishers who sacrifice themselves to the punishment of people, and therefore, you know, uh, cooperation is, you know, achieved. And it's also cemented by our reading these stories, but it seems to me to, there's a kind of cynicism at the heart of it. And I realize that's just kind of an intellectual temperamental reply, but, uh, but, I, but it's not only that. I find, it a, I find it a kind of a narrow sense of like, of, uh, what humans are like. But thank you. Yeah. Let's have one last question. Okay. I need a fucking oh. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. And first a comment and then a question. Can you tell me your field? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Peter Allen and I'm an anthropologist. Oh, okay. And the comment is that you proved at least half of the old saw that William James was a psychologist who wrote like a novelist and Henry was a novelist who wrote like a psychologist. <laughs> Um, but my question, I want to interrogate uh, uh, <clears throat> Eve's uh, interpretation. And as a social scientist, you know, we look for patterns. Uh -huh. And I'm curious, because I'm not familiar with very much of the corpus of James's work, whether there is, there are other examples of cryptic homosexuality, or whether this is a complete outlier because I think her case would be much strengthened if she could point to other examples where he wrote about homosexuality in a very veiled way, uh, and this is just another example thereof. Well, um, her method, as I uh, indicated by slipping in the word anachronistic before gay lexicon, is to basically do a kind of close reading that focuses in on terms that um, weren't really in play at the time of the writing of the story in the way that they are now, um, including queer. Um, and most of it has to do with, I think, I mean, and, and the other part of the method is this kind of sense of foreboding, doom, ostracism, um, so that it's, so, and you can find that all over James. That's called living in the world of Henry James. So, so I guess I would say, um, yeah, I think that she could easily find more fodder, but that it would be susceptible to the same criticism that I'm making. But, you know, I'm not like, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a value to her reading. I think it's, you know, and I, for many reasons, including the moment at which it appeared and the effect it had, um, both in uh, gay and lesbian studies, queer theory, and literary studies. Great. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking you.